The question in our mind is not so much does it get to 500,000, but, but how quickly. Hello there from Bedford, the Bitcoin mecca of the world. How are you all? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, which is brought to you by the mighty Kraken, the best place to buy, sell and trade Bitcoin. I'm your host, Peter McCormack, and today I welcome back Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss, where we're going to be discussing their paper, The Case for the $500,000 Bitcoin. But before that, I do have a message from my amazing show sponsors. So first up today, we're going to talk about BlockFi, who are the future of Bitcoin and financial services. Now with BlockFi, you can open up an interest account and you can start earning interest on your Bitcoin. And I am a customer been a customer for nearly a year now and I've earned just over one Bitcoin in interest which is very very cool. You can also use your Bitcoin as collateral and take out a USD loan and you can fund your BlockFi account directly from your Bitcoin wallet and with the BlockFi mobile app you can now fully manage your account on the go and they also have a big Halloween promotion for new customers and with Halloween being my birthday I'm a massive fan of this. From now until the end of the month, you can earn up to $275 in Bitcoin when opening up a BlockFi account. All you need to do is go to the address blockfi.com forward slash Peter. And if you're interested in checking BlockFi out, I do recommend you do your own research. Then head over to their website at blockfi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I dot com. Also, let's talk about Kraken, the mighty, mighty Kraken. The best place for buying and selling Bitcoin and the only goddamn place that I use for buying and selling Bitcoin. But why is that? Well, firstly, they are consistently rated the best and most secure cryptocurrency exchange. And you know what? Security is really important to me. They also have best in class customer service. So whatever issue you have, they're going to help you get that shit sorted, whoever you are and wherever you are. And if you want to start trading Bitcoin, they have every possible tool you could want. So whatever level of experience you are, if you head over to Kraken.com, it just couldn't be easier to sign up and start trading Bitcoin. They also have a beautiful mobile first app so you can buy Bitcoin on the go. And with their margin trading, futures and OTC desk, Kraken has every option covered for you. There is no better place to trade Bitcoin and you can find out more at Kraken.com or download the app. It's available for the iPhone and Android. Just search for Kraken Pro, which is K-R-A-K-E-N-P-R-O. Okay, so on to the show today, and I am very happy to welcome back Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss from the show. Had them on recently, but they also just put out this new paper, their very bullish case for the $500,000 Bitcoin, and with something like that, I've obviously got to get them back on. Now, sometimes these predictions seem a little bit crazy, right? You're like, we've heard people talk about a million dollar Bitcoin and $100,000 Bitcoin, but there is a lot of logic behind this. I think it's sound logic. So if you haven't read the paper, I highly recommend it. I've left a link to it in the show notes and it kind of echoes a a number of the macro ideas I've been discussing with other people and the problems that we're having with potential currency debasements coming up. And, you know, when you start looking at gold and you start comparing it to Bitcoin, it really starts to make sense that Bitcoin becomes a better and more usable store of value. And if it starts to replace gold, then obviously their prediction might be right. So it's a really well-written piece. And I do recommend you go and read it, It, you know, ideally before you listen to this, but you probably won't. But either way, definitely go and check it out. Um, And even Tyler said, you know, it's pretty conservative estimation. I I think he's right as well. So anyway, as I said, obviously I had to get them on. I needed my fix of hopium. And we do get some other things as well. Um, Similar to my interview with Brian, I pushed them on open source development and they're keen to help supporting that. So that's very, very cool. And I also put the idea to them that they should invest in buying Bedford Town Football Club, which will probably be the greatest investment they would ever make in their lives. So hopefully they will do that as well. Anyway, this is a banger of a show. Hope you enjoy it. You got any questions, you know you can reach out to me. And I reply to everyone. Every one of you that emails me, I get back to you. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Outside of that, uh, go and check out Defy. I've been telling you this every week, but have you checked it out yet? Especially my series about Ghislaine Maxwell. That's getting pretty hot now. Some stuff in the newspapers now. Her deposition was just been unsealed. So, yeah, it's getting pretty interesting. And uh, we've got part six coming out on Monday. It might go up to a seventh part. That's available at defiance.news. Outside of that, have a great weekend. Love you all and see you all next week. Cameron, Tyler, good to see you both again. How are you? We're good, thanks. Great to see hey, you, Peter. We're good. Thanks for having us. Uh, good to have you both back on, even though it's uh, only recently had you on. But I had your article recently. Um, obviously, when you start talking about a five hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin, it's quite exciting. But there's some good rationale in there, and I've uh, forwarded it on to a few of my friends, 
who don't believe me. <laughs> but uh, I thought it'd be good to get you on, talk about it. Also, it's a good time to talk about it because there's so much weird stuff going on in the world, um, especially your side of the pond, which I can't visit at the moment because they won't let anybody in. But there's so much stuff happening right now. I just think it's a really good time to get into it, talk about your thesis. So good starting point. Uh, we'll start with you, Cameron. Like, What was the background to writing this article? Like, What was the inspiration to you both? So I think um, we actually started writing this, I think, in January, pre-pandemic, because we started to think about what the government's been doing with the U.S. dollar um, for the past decade or so, and traditional sort of stores of value and hedges. And then the pandemic hit, um, and kind of around like March um, in New York, and we sort of stopped writing and went put it on pause to kind of see what was going to happen and then restarted writing it sometime this summer uh, once the dust had settled and we kind of had a sense of what the government had done in response. So interestingly enough, it wasn't actually a pandemic related piece. It was really a, a sort of a, a piece on the debt reckoning that we think is is uh, coming over the next you know five, 10 years. And then you know why we thought Bitcoin made a lot of sense uh, for people who sort of want to hedge against inflation. So really the story got uh, way more interesting sort of because of the pandemic. We, we thought it was still compelling um, what the government, the US government has been doing to the dollar pre-pandemic, but even more so now. Um, so the stage is really set for what we think is is likely, uh, you know, inflation and Bitcoin is really the best way to combat that. And there's been a couple yeah, of other I mean, things. That, sorry, you go on, Tyler. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that um, when people first hear about Bitcoin, it's like, what is this crazy internet money thing? And so what helped us early on was to think about, okay, what's it sort of analogize a little bit to, and we came up with the gold framework, which is a pretty classic way to understand Bitcoin at this point. Um, so that helped us early on understand like why this was interesting in one way. It's not just internet money, but it's gold 2.0. And then just as a sort of a thought exercise for ourselves, but also it's great to share that with other people is like, okay, what what is Bitcoin and why is it important or relevant to me? And that was really the impetus to Okay, we we bought some of our earliest Bitcoin in in 2012. How have things changed or not changed since then? Is Bitcoin is gold itself still an interesting asset class or investment for people? And that was sort of the impetus to look back at like the last 10 years since the beginning of Bitcoin, which was born in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis um, and the pseudonymous creator Satoshi talked about the problems with the existing system, how much trust is required to place into bankers, uh, government officials, uh, central bankers, and, and just governments in general, and how that had led us astray and led us down so many times. So we wanted to sort of look back at the decades since Bitcoin had happened, like uh, kind of reassess our own investment thesis, like is thing, are things more relevant or not? And then, um, of course, they have become only more re relevant, but the pandemic and the ensuing central banking tools to get us through it have only catalyzed or rather, or rather set the, the, uh, the stage for Bitcoin um, even more. So we, we actually tabled the blog um, when every, we, it was almost done when the pandemic and the lockdowns and the economies, the economic shock happened. And we're like, okay, that's this is going to change a bit. <laughs> and so we sort of waited that out for a couple of months, waited till to see the, re the government responses, like the CARES Act in the US, a lot of the stimulus. And then we just realized, wait, like this, this piece is, is even more relevant. The, the outlook's gotten even more scary for fiat regimes oh my gosh, like Bitcoin's like your only, you know, um, saving grace. And so we put those thoughts together and, and then finally published it. So what you're really saying is the, the pandemic has accelerated what was happening and what you kind of like accelerated your own thesis. Yeah, pretty much. You're sort of seeing that the pandemic in some ways like has pushed us into the future 
and in some ways pushed us behind. We've sort of seen the the decline of brick and mortar retail has been accelerated by this. The onslaught of e-commerce and big tech has already been accelerated as well. Um, so it was very much a tale of of two cities or two countries or or two worlds before the pandemic hit. And it only really pushed us and accelerated us through to that more. It's been record quarters on Wall Street for much of big tech, yet the rest of the economy and Main Street is is really suffering. And then why I say it's also pushed us in a time machine in the past a little bit is because at least in America, you see the second coming of drive-in movie theaters, which is really a relic of my parent, you know, the boomer generation, my parents, and and something I'd never see to, you know, a part of America um, that I thought I'd never see, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the the good old days, I guess, of America. And then now we have drive-in theaters with, with social distancing, drive-in concerts. So in one way, we've taken a step back, but uh, very much have accelerated some of the the economic trends. Um, and, and frankly, like inequality that that has been a um, growing and growing in America, and it is definitely concerning. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll get on to the inequality bit because I think we've we've got a kind of polit- political section to cover anyway with regard to this. Uh, another thing that stood out um, within the article is that it's you're still doing an educational piece in there beyond just talking about um, you know the stores of value and the problems with oil, the USD, and, and gold. But you're actually still doing an education job on. Bitcoin and how how much do you still have to do that? Because you've got to see mixing um, Wall Street circles. You mix with finance people. Whilst we've seen an adoption, an institutional adoption of Bitcoin, Grayscale's trust is growing. We've seen MicroStrategy. We've seen Square uh, start investing. You still having to do a big educational job, and is that job getting easier? So I think um, you know the. Since we've been in Bitcoin, education has been like a really big part of our journey and and trying to educate others about sort of what this technology is and what it's not. And I think, you know, when we got involved, when we first started buying Bitcoin in the summer, fall of 2012, the narrative back then was Silk Road, that this is only used by drug dealers and illicit activity. And um, so we actually didn't go public with our our investment for about six months because we were worried that people were just going to interpret it the wrong way. As we know, the Silk Road narrative really wasn't the true narrative. The vast majority of Bitcoin transactions weren't being used for for that kind of activity. Um, So we spent a lot of time trying to educate people about you know the the gold thesis for Bitcoin and why it really wasn't the case. In fact, it, Bitcoin's really not even anonymous, and that was a pretty common misconception back in the day. And I think there's always going to be some element of education because it's a new technology. And I think a lot of people still don't understand how straightforward it is to buy Bitcoin these days, and how you can literally go to an exchange, sign up. There's custodians. Gemini is a good example. We're a New York trust company regulated like a bank. And the experience is very much like going to a brokerage and signing up for a brokerage account. So I think that's always going to be there, at least until Bitcoin gets sort of so mainstream. It's probably like the early days of the internet when people are like, what is this thing called the internet? And if you look at, uh, I think, Tyler, you, you recently tweeted about Jeff Bezos's first like 50 meetings to raise a, a million dollars for Amazon. And the, the biggest question he got was, what is the internet? So there, there's definitely going to be some of that. Are you, so are you still dealing with those questions yourselves? And- you know, not, not as much, but a lot of, you know, sometimes, and I think it depends who's asking it you know, can you touch Bitcoin? Where does it exist? Things like that. You talk to a Gen Zer and you're just having a much different conversation. They don't want physical hardware like gold. They want software. They're streaming. They live online. Their entire lives are online. Explaining why digital money and crypto make sense and why you want that, it's not necessary. And I think money, you know, at the end of the day is really in the eye of the beholder. And it's this like big 
experiment that's been going on for for thousands and thousands of years. And the gold meme is like super strong. We all grew up with it and we, you see it in movies, it's shiny, it's in jewelry. It has this familiarity. And so a lot of that has just been kind of burned in our in our minds that, hey, this is a store of value and it's, it's built up trust over uh, multiple millennia. And, and that's, that's one of the biggest challenges Bitcoin faces is it's only about a decade old. With that being said, the adoption cycle of technology today is, is growing at a rapid pace. And so what Bitcoin has managed to do in a decade go literally from, you know, white paper to $200 billion of market cap is pretty phenomenal that it's covered that much ground. And so I think that, you know, over the next decade, we could very well see uh, a exponential growth. And that's sort of how we, you know, came into the Bitcoin $500,000 a coin thesis. We looked at the market cap of gold, and then we looked at some other elements like what if a what if a central bank were to diversify some of its holdings? A lot of central banks they hold fiat foreign reserve currency and they hold gold uh, and different assets. So what if they took some portion of that and put it into gold? And then you you, you look at like a ten eleven trillion dollar market cap for Bitcoin potential, but arguably even greater because. Bitcoin has attributes that far surpass gold in terms of its uh, portability and the ability to program Bitcoin and move it easily. And so you 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 sort of back into five hundred thousand dollars a coin, and it's pretty straightforward. It's not a very complicated assumption at all, and that's really you know where we are at now. The, the the question in our mind is not so much does it get to five hundred thousand, but but how quickly? And I think that's unclear. And and part of what will drive it there, you know, there's always these catalysts, some that you can predict and some you can't. But one of the catalysts is is potentially hyperinflation due to all of the debt the debt around the world. And as Tyler has mentioned, the pandemic has sort of accelerated us a couple of years forward. If you look around what's happening with big tech and retail. I think it's also pushed us closer to that debt reckoning, that point where people start to look at the U.S. deficit and say, this isn't credible. It no longer sort of passes um, a reasonable test of whether or not the U.S. can pay, pay it. And at that point, the U.S. You know, debt bag holders are going to stop lending. And that's when it gets, you know, it's going to get really ugly. Yeah, so it's really interesting reading through the article because whilst it was oil, gold and the US dollar, the majority of the article focused on the US dollar and it, a lot of it resonated with me because do you, do you know Lynn Alden? I did an interview with her recently and she's a macroeconomist. Mm-hmm. Um, in the interview, she was talking about um, 51 of the last 52 countries who have uh, reached a 130% GDP to debt ratio have ended up going through a currency devaluation. And I think the U.S. I, I, I'm trying to go by memory, but I think it might have hit 135 percent at some point. So some kind of devaluation right. is likely. We entered the pandemic, I think, around just above 100, and I think we're going to hit, you know, 135 in the next year or two. So it's it's accelerated uh, substantially. And then there's other countries entering where their ratios pre-pandemic were were significantly higher. I think China was around 300 percent and it's probably now closer to 320 yeah i think japan was the only one that hasn't i think that was the one lynn was talking about but she was explaining a weird scenario another thing that just you made me think of was also with this kind of like potential acceleration into into bitcoin um i'm not sure if you're aware of this uh parker lewis he wrote a series called gradually that um then suddenly talking about the kind of movement into bitcoin i think Something like Square or mm-hmm. MicroStrategy is the first kind of signals into the market. I think if you add into a potential bull run of Bitcoin in an all to all time new highs, we'll start to get some positive media coverage. I think the movement then upwards could be very, very quick. And I think that's potentially what mm-hmm. you're talking about. I'm assuming that's what you've been looking at as well, Tyler, right? Yeah, I mean, I I would sort of contend that five hundred thousand Bitcoin is actually pretty conservative. 
and the the game hasn't even really started. You're seeing hints of it, right? With micro strategy, putting treasuries with square. Um, but what if every fortune 100 or 500 company does that? What if central banks start doing that? I mean, it hasn't even started and in, in to use a US baseball term, you know, bottom of the first inning, maybe. And we see this, we're on the front line with Gemini because we see, see the institutional customers versus the retail. Yes, there are institutional customers like market makers, high frequency traders, some alternative aggressive hedge funds, a lot of family offices, but mm -hmm. like Wall Street's not here yet. Institutions aren't in Bitcoin right now. It's been a retail phenomenon for the last decade. So like Wall Street talks about it, they're aware of Bitcoin, but they haven't, uh, they're not really in it uh, from our perspective. And so, you know, but it's starting to happen. And one thing, one thing that did, did happen a lot with, with the pandemic and the lockdown, um, a lot of people came back to us and said, we believe in the Bitcoin gold thesis. And these are dyed in the wool Wall Streeters, the biggest skeptics in the room. They're boomers. They're not really technology people. They'd be the first to be slagging on Bitcoin um, for the last 10 years. But then they saw what was happening with the Fed, the money printing. They saw the deficit we've been running for the last 10 years. The US has run a surplus only four years in the last 50 years. In 1992, Ross Perot made headlines because he banged the table about running a budget surplus. He was like, we have an issue, we have a deficit spending issue, we have a debt issue. That was in 1992. 30 years ago. That was before the tech bubble. That was before the credit crisis that spawned Bitcoin in 2008. Uh, that was before the lockdown. This has been an issue for 30 years, and it's only gotten dramatically much worse. So anybody who's paying attention to what's happening in fiat regimes, and unfortunately, that's not that many people, are completely spooked and scared. And they recognize, like the Paul Tudor Joneses of the world, back in the 70s when we had stagflation, that gold was the trade. It would have been Bitcoin if Bitcoin was invented, but this is pre-internet, this is pre-Bitcoin. Today, hands down, that trade to stave off the scourge of inflation is without a doubt Bitcoin because it is, because it is the only known asset in the world that has a fixed supply. Gold is scarce, but its supply increases. And in fact, the supply of above ground has increased two thirds since 1950. So it does it does grow uh, for many reasons we can sort of get into, but the idea is that Bitcoin, no matter how much demand there is, that supply is fixed. Wall Streeters get that, and we saw them all, come, a lot of them um, come running to Gemini immediately in the beginning of the lockdown and the pandemic, precisely because of that reasoning. And and just, I mean, I think oil provides like a really interesting foil because in the early 2000s, peak oil theory was, was pretty popular. This idea that the U.S.'s oil production had peaked um, and the U.S. was an oil importer and now the U.S. is a net exporter, oil net exporter. And fracking and new technology has been able to drill and access oil in in the earth that was previously not thought possible and so when you look at like mining techniques if if the price of gold increases and or energy costs come down or some combination thereof uh we will find and produce more gold the supply of gold increases with demand and the same is true for oil uh the same is not true for bitcoin it's really the first commodity of its kind where uh, demand simply does not impact supply. Well, look, I hope you're right. But quite interestingly, if you are, I've run the numbers. I think that makes you guys trillionaires. You could actually end up becoming the richest guys on the planet. And I don't know about you, but when I thought about that, I just thought that's, that's a fuck you Zuckerberg moment. Can we say that? You can. <laughs> I can. I'll do that for you. I'll, I'll go and fuck yeah, sure. you. But, but seriously, like, but he'll probably get some Bitcoin because he's smart. I don't know, man. 
Imagine if Facebook put some treasury into Bitcoin. Wow. And speaking wow. of corporate treasury, yeah. I mean, right now, you know, MicroStrategy obviously was the pioneer in that strategy, for lack of a better word. And Square is sort of the second to follow suit. It's a risky, you know, I think most corporate boardrooms would say, oh, that's a risky strategy for your treasury. But there will be a time not too soon where it'll be irresponsible not to put some amount of your US dollars and other fiat into something like Bitcoin, likely Bitcoin. And I think that that's the future that we see. It's like hard to see perhaps right now. I mean, when we got into Bitcoin, it was this crazy, wild west, scary thing. But Cameron, to interject, it's hard to see how that doesn't happen. Mm. We've been down this path for decades. And it doesn't matter who's in office in the US, Democrat, Republican, uh, the money printer still goes burr. And the ability to actually rise, raise taxes and lower spending, we've been unable to do that as a country. Like there no longer is a political party that's like the hard money, tight fiscal uh, party. It doesn't matter. It's sort of like the, the Fed wags the dog. Whoever wins in November, the money printing will continue. And it seems to span all the, um, no matter who gets elected, no matter which party. Now, maybe Brock Pierce, if he gets elected, he has different ideas, the Libertarian Party. I don't know. I haven't seen his platform. But, you know, as it stands, like, this has been um, something adopted across the aisle. And I don't know how it stops. I don't know how you turn off the printer once you're addicted and hooked the way we are, the way Wall Street is. I don't see how that stops. And if it keeps going as it has been going, the math uh, simply won't work out. The ability for the US economy to grow fast enough to service its debt will no longer be mathematically credible on any level. And I don't know who who said this, whether it was Einstein or Buffett, that compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. You want that working in your favor in terms of growing your wealth. You don't want that working against you in terms of your debt obligations compounding against you. And right now, like compound interest, the eighth wonder of the world is working against the US dollar and all fiat regimes. Um, They are headed down this path. And I just don't see how we get off of it. Mm. And, and another another thing on that is that sort of if you measure success by stock market gains, then you're it's very hard to wean yourself off of the money printer. The the stock market has gone up, you know, incredible amounts over the past decade, and it's sort of you know you keep printing printing all this money, it's going to just you know go right into the market um, and increase values and basically destroy signal. And I think that's, you see a lot of active managers, they can't actually beat the market anymore. Yeah, but that's the big lie, right? Because whilst the stock market's going up in dollar terms, I think it was Pomp who was showing me the chart or someone, where if if you look at the stock market in gold terms, it's actually dropped. I can't remember the time period, but that's kind of like the big lie. And I think that's what a lot of people are, are missing. I also, I just... I think the the problem is the there's no incentive for any political party to stop the money printer because it's not going to be a popular solution because ultimately it's going to lead to hardship. It's it's I can't remember said to me. It said it's like a it's like an opioid addiction. You've you've at some point you've just got to come off it and you're going to go through some really hard times. But you know, is Donald Trump going to want to do that and and, and miss election? Will he want to do it in the ne- next election cycle and be seen as like? Uh, a, a failed president. Nobody, there's no incentive for any political party to do it. Yeah. The the only person who could do it would be a second term president who no longer is going for re-election and sort of says, hey, this is just going to end really poorly. I don't want to continue to engage in this generational plunder. Uh, I want to hand you know the country down to the next generation mm-hmm. in a in reasonable shape. But if you're up for re-election, <laughs> no way. There's there's no chance that you're gonna. But but who also who wants that legacy? Oh, my second term was the greatest depression since the Great Depression. It was like greater than the Great Depression. 
who wants that legacy, right? And at the end of the day, like, you know, Wall Street, the bankers, there's so much like influence mm. there. There just really is. I mean, if you just look at like even um, how the families of these parties, either side, they're, they make money in financial services. They're all basically Wall Streeters at the end of the day. That's who their friends are. That's who they play golf with. That's who they lunch with. And that's, that's what's so brilliant about crypto and, 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 and Bitcoin is that there isn't, um, what is it, 12 people behind a curtain making decisions for the entire, um, you know, the currency of the U.S. dollar in the economy. If you ever invented money from scratch today, let's say, or you did it again, no one would say it's a great idea to put all this power in the hands of 12 people who make decisions behind cl closed doors that we can't see. You'd never set it up that way. You'd set it up like Bitcoin or Ethereum or some other crypto uh, decentralized protocol or DeFi with, with a governance token, right? That's what's I find really fascinating about these governance tokens is people can literally like dictate the strategy. If you look at, you know, YFI, I earn, right? You choose the vaults and the strategies and it's, it's sort of um, built on voting. Well, I mean, I've got your I've got your chart in your article where you compare Bitcoin with gold. And I think if you add Ethereum or DeFi into that chart, Bitcoin still wins, right? So I think luckily, unfortunately, we have that. I would I will add one thing in it's like I, can't, I was trying to find the article then when you talked about it. I, I, Jerome Powell is, is definitely concerned about the growing debt. And he's also alluded to the future generations are going to have to pay for the mistakes of the current generations. And, you know, like I, I'm not a huge fan of Jerome Powell, but at least he recognized it. He talked about it. Yeah. And, and he's already, um, we actually link in our article to the fact that they're already basically telegraphing that they're soft, we're soft defaulting as a country. We're trying to yeah. spike a higher inflation rate, which uh, makes it easier to pay back our debts. You know, we pay the same dollar amount of dollars, but they're worth a lot less. And that's sort of your best, probably, of your three options, like one being hard default, which is a disaster. If the U.S. economy, U.S. dollar hard defaults, mm -hmm. then the world has some really, really big problems. And then austerity measures are just equally very difficult historically to implement. Even in the U.S., um, you know, we've managed to run a surplus four of the last 50 years. So that doesn't seem likely. So sort of like the debt monetization or soft default path forward is really um, the the best of the worst options. And he's already like alluded to that, which is I thought was pretty unprecedented. But like most people aren't paying attention. You know, you are, we are, we're into this stuff. Um, but most people, I mean, everyone uses money. It's, it's like a... Um, you can't live in the world without understanding the concept of money. It's so important to everyone's life, like the transfer of value. But so few people stop to take a look at what it actually is, what it means. That's that's one of the greatest gifts of getting into Bitcoin and crypto is even though we, we studied economics in college, it made us really rethink and examine and challenge all of our assumptions, ideas of, of, of money. Um, and, I, and I hope, and I, and I think for a lot of people, that has. This has certainly been a reckoning. I think, you know, the average person, or you're more likely to find someone on the street who's like, yeah, there's a lot of money printing. I'm receiving a $1,200 check every two weeks. And where's this coming from? You know, it's like this helicopter money concept was just, I, ne I never thought we would live to see that day in America where you'd have a helicopter money drop. And I don't think it's lost on the average citizen that like, hey, I just got furloughed and I'm receiving this money. Where is that coming from? Is it just printed out of thin air, monopoly money? Oh, wait, yes, it is. What's the value of money anyway? Um, so I hope it does catalyze a lot of people to getting smarter on money. You know, it's sort of like language. It's this thing we use every day, but um, most of us don't even think about syntax and grammar a whole lot. Um, but it's always great to dig a little deeper. Yeah, I'm just not sure people how much people do think about it. So it depends depends who it is. Like um like I was talking to my 
you know, my personal trainer. It's funny. I've got he's got into Bitcoin. Interestingly, nice. But at the same time, yeah, yeah. And I was thinking about getting him on sometime because he's a re- he's a really interesting person's perspective because he's a real just normal guy, right? But he um he he was furloughed and he was getting money direct from the government um when he wasn't working, but he had no concept of where that came from, what it meant, and didn't really have a proper concept of inflation. And I think what it is, is I think as we grow up, we're kind of gaslighted into believing inflation is a natural part of a, a growing and healthy economy, which really it isn't, but we've been gaslighted into it. And and when I was talking to Lynn Alden, she, you know, she was with you on the soft default. She said a, a currency devaluation is coming. It's going to be through inflation, and it's going to happen over probably likely over a 10-year period. Um, the starting point, not exactly sure. I'm just not sure people do really understand it because I, I've tried to explain it to people and I've tried to introduce them to the concept of Bitcoin and I've bored the hell out of them. <laughs> I haven't converted many people. Well, it's hard. It's not exactly light cocktail or dinner conversation. You know, and, and you know, the three of us, we think about this a lot. It's still complicated, mm-hmm. right? Um I don't keep up on the economic data, like day to day coming out of the Fed and the other bureaus in America. So, I mean, very few people train spot that information, you know, even rates. So it's a good question. But I I do feel like Gen Zers are becoming more financially sophisticated. I think a lot of people got those checks, at least in America. And we're like, they fired up Robin Hood and they're like, hey, how do I get my money to work for me when I sleep? You know, how do I untether myself from being labor, right? And just having the 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 billable or the workable hour. How can I put my money to work, earn something that sort of compounds um, when I'm not toiling and sweating? Um, so even though like, yeah, there is a bit of like, the stock market is a bit um, seems frothy, and um, it worries me that how are things going so well there when we're in a freaking lockdown and unemployment's record? It's because uh, stocks only go up, right? Right. Yeah. Numbers like, only go up, and that's a true <laughs> statement, which is like super scary, right? To to kind of admit that right now, but at least people are getting dirty with it and thinking about it and 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 investing, right? I think that. That's definitely different than it was maybe even 10 years ago. But things have become more accessible. I mean, technology has enabled it. Robin Hood has enabled it. And I think that was one of the points. I actually put it in my list. So when I was reading your kind of thesis for you know, the half, uh, half a million pound Bitcoin, one of the things that I added into this, because you, you did it as the um, you know, comparison to the gold market, which is $9 trillion dollars. I actually tried to buy a bit of gold during the pandemic. I, th- I thought I just I've got Bitcoin. I want a bit of gold. Um, I just you know I don't think Bitcoin's one hundred percent guaranteed. I think it'd be useful just to have a small amount. And I tried to go through the process of buying it. It was a pain. Uh, by the end, I just couldn't be bothered, and I ended up buying more Bitcoin, which is kind of funny when you think about it. Um, but I think the ease of buying Bitcoin as a retail customer. I think it's just so much easier and it's so much more in our face, right? It's like if you sell somebody on the concept of buying Bitcoin, they can download an app and they can be buying it pretty much instantly and, and custody, custody in it almost straight away. Whereas with gold, there's, there's a real effort. And I had to also think about, well, where am I going to store it? Am I going to keep it in the house? Am I going to get a safety deposit box? And I was just like, and then like, what if I want to sell it? I just, honestly, I just couldn't be bothered in the end. So I think the, I think if, if Bitcoin ends up being considered a better store of value than gold, I think it far exceeds your nine trillion because it's far more accessible to everyone. Yeah, I think that's right. And all you need really is a data connection, and then you can send or receive Bitcoin. And I think you know the we we sort of uh, talk about the diehard problem in our piece. Uh, if you were to actually like rob the Federal Reserve in Manhattan, uh, you would need. I think something like 12 or 13 dump trucks to move that gold and get it off the island. And then you'd be loading it into like 747s and flying it to wherever. It's really hard to move a lot of gold. It's really heavy. And and when things get really bad, um, apocalyptically bad, you know, it's much easier to move Bitcoin around. It's hard to move gold. And if you think of like the lockdowns and the pandemic, 
when people were literally sheltering in place, you're not moving gold during that time period. Yeah, that's die, die hard with a vengeance, right? Yeah, I think that I think that's the right. Third one. Yeah. Did you ever yeah, consider so, um, an ETF wrapper for gold, or did you feel like that defeated the purpose? It defeated the purpose for me because I think the reason was did was it I can't remember now. Wasn't there a bit of news where that was one company wasn't going to be honoring? Gold that was. Uh, I thought, oh, I are you talking about uh, Venezuela's gold stash? That was no, like... no, not that. We've, we've, we've. No, got I that. think you're talking about the windows, right? Don't don't some of the ETFs have windows where you can actually show up with like a receipt and redeem gold, perhaps out of the wrapper? Is that is that what you're talking about? I, I can't remember what it was, but uh-huh. um, it definitely wasn't Venezuela. We've got we've got the Venezuelan gold in the UK. Um, yeah. It was something to do with redeemable gold or whatever. And I just looked at it all and I thought, being somebody who custodies my own Bitcoin, you know, having I don't have the security set up you guys have, but I, I do uh, I, I I do have a pretty good security set up, and and I know it's mine. I've got it custodied. I just like I wanted the I wanted the physical gold. I didn't want right. any situation whereby I'd have a some kind of claim, whether it's even though it's an ETF. Um, I just I just wanted the physical gold, and it was just too much hard work. Right, you want to be ready for the zombie apocalypse. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, an ETF is just not gonna <laughs> not gonna work. Next up, I talked to Cameron and Tyler more about the case for the five hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin, but before that. Let's hear from my amazing sponsors. Okay, so we've got a few shows left with Least Authority, so make sure you do go and check these out. They are for all you techies out there. If you are building applications, then Least Authority is someone you need to be talking to. They are a security consulting company who are pushing the limits on how to build privacy-respecting solutions. They specialize in security audits, design specification reviews, and security by design, and they can help you improve the security of your wallet application, key management solution, layer 2 protocol, P to p network design use of cryptography and so much more if you want to boost your security strategy then you can arrange a no obligation call to find out how least authority can help you on your next project just head over to their website hit the schedule a call button and that's at leastauthority.com which is l-e-a-s-t-a-u-t-h-o-r-i-t-y.com also with a frothy market you've definitely got to take a look at cars at the moment because they are the premier service in Bitcoin security. Now, if you don't have your security shit together and you're looking at the prices and you're thinking ahead what your Bitcoin might be worth, this is really something you need to get your head around. If this is something you need to do, you need to be getting your security sorted. Now, with Castro, it couldn't be easier. I mean, I've done it. I've signed up. I'm a customer. And what they enabled you to do is protect your Bitcoin from hackers, your own stupid mistakes, in-person attacks, device failures, and it looks so much more. And they also have a product for every Bitcoiner out there. So with their Casa Gold product, you get triple the security of a hardware wallet, and that's only going to cost you $10 a month. With Casa Platinum, you get their 3 or 5 multi-sig. That's the best protection for large Bitcoin holders, and that also comes at a great price. But if you want their full service offering, then you want Casa Diamond. With that, you're going to get a customized personal security review, inheritance planning, and of course, their best in class security. There is no better time to upgrade your Bitcoin security and get total peace of mind. Find out more at keys.casa, which is K-E-Y-S dot C-A-S-A. And lastly today, but never least, because I love these guys, it's sportsbet.io, the best place for online gaming. And we've got football back. We've had some crazy results. Liverpool doing pretty well, not as well as I hoped. Sadly, Tottenham have been winning. Yeah, we don't like that. But we have seen the return of the Champions League, a competition I fully expect Liverpool to win, and also the Europa League. And my sponsor, Sportsbet.io, is welcoming back these competitions with a special offer for footy lovers. They are offering a number of missions whereby if you hit a streak during the competition, you can win up to one Bitcoin in cash prizes. Just head over to sportsbet.io forward slash promotions to opt in and view the terms of the promotion. If you want to find out more, that's sportsbet.io, which is S P O R T S B E T dot I O. So, Peter, what got you into thinking about these concepts, you know, being a gold bug or a, a Bitcoin bug? Like, you know, what started you on your journey? What was like the aha moment? Well, 
It's kind of ironic, really, because where our conversation started. You don't remember my 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 starting point was the Silk Road, but we don't we won't need, we, we don't need to go back down. But that, but like uh, certainly <laughs> before that, like you were. I mean, you're 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 talking to economists about soft defaults and currency devaluations. Like yeah. before Silk Road, or probably before Bitcoin was invented, something got you thinking about this stuff. Well, well, look, there's a couple of things that have happened. One, I got divorced, which financially was devastating. It being the highest, the higher earner out of the divorced couple, um, my finances got devastated. And my company that I had at the time had an advertising agency. You know, it collapsed very quickly afterwards. So my fan- financial position changed from a very healthy position to quite precarious within the space of a year. And I didn't have a pension. And I, I, there was two opportunities to have a, a decent pension was to build a company, a valuable company and sell it and to make an investment. The kind of investment I needed to put into traditional pensions, the amount of money each month just was not doable. So I was like, well, I'm just going to make, I'm going to make a bet on Bitcoin. That's going to be my bet. If Bitcoin does what I think it will do, I, I will have a pension. So I bought the amount of Bitcoin I needed, but but my conviction really changed this year. So what actually the, the change I made is, um, <clears throat> Whilst it's only a small podcast, it does do okay. I mean, I've shared with you guys some revenue revenue numbers. I wasn't comfortable holding those pounds in the bank. So I now hold 60% of my uh, balance sheet on Bitcoin. It's not a huge number, but it's still a number that's relevant to me. Um, And that's a profitable number now. And I think the main thing is that I am very concerned about the economy for the limited amount I know. I'm concerned about the financial future of my children um, because lots of things are changing. And I want to be a saver rather than a spender. And I think the most prudent way to save over a multi-year, potentially multi-decade financial plan is with Bitcoin. The only thing, the only fear I have is some regulatory issue. I have no other fear with Bitcoin and its uh, success apart from regulatory. Mm, right. Yeah, the, the regulatory landscape in the US is pretty well worn at this point. I mean, I think it's unlikely to change for the negative. Mm. Of course, anything can happen. But look, we're regulated as a New York trust company. Uh, New York banking law is over 100 years old. Um, it's been declared as a commodity uh, in the 2015 coin flip ruling. So there's a lot of sort of case law rulings and regulatory frameworks that I think are, are pretty well established at this point that Bitcoin fits into um, on both the state and the federal level in the U.S. So I, I feel good about the U.S. and I think the same is true for the U.K. and the EU. There's going to be parts of the world where Bitcoin is is banned and outlawed, and those are likely the parts where they're most fearful of the technology, and they're trying to you know control capital. And uh, and so it's pretty pretty obvious what's what's going on there, and that's actually I think a good thing. It it, it sort of mm. validates the thesis when when uh, places like Venezuela are are trying to crack down on things like Bitcoin. But I, I guess going back to like an earlier part of the conversation, like if you grew up in in a high inflation environment, the way you think about money um, is totally different than someone growing up in the U.S. And so I think, you know, mm. in, in, in places like Argentina, you might purchase a motorcycle to store value um, in addition to wanting to ride it. And, and when you lose 25, 30, 40% of your, the value of your money on a yearly annual basis, that's traumatizing it and, it. and it changes the way you think. And we, you know, have had, you know, the US has been relatively well managed. Now, there's people that will tell you that it's still horribly managed. Um, and it's, you know, the US dollars lost something like 90, 95% of its value since let's say the seventies or so. And gold is, you know, increased 26 times or more, but on a relative scale, it's sort of the best of the worst in terms of fiat currencies. But the average lifespan, I think of a fiat currency is 27 years, 27 years. Wow. I don't think most people know that at least in the U.S. And, and also um, the experiment of the U.S. dollar not being tied to a precious metal is, is very young. I think it wasn't mm-hmm. until the 70s when we parted ways with you know, gold as a, as a backer 
of the dollars. And some people have argued would even go further back. The dollar has lost its way since like the 1930s or just before that. Um, and we broke that peg in the 70s because we were, wanted to spend more money than we had. Finance wars like the Vietnam War. Yeah, so Vietnam War, yeah. the U.S. dollar as as we know it today is only 50 years old. You know, it's not the same dollar that it was back in the World War II era before that. And in the scheme of the history of money, that's just like nothing. It really is an experiment. And it's crazy to me how many people assume that's how it's always been. Like money, I just grew up with this green stuff in my wallet. Yeah. Like that's what money is. It's it's nothing different. It's like, no, no, that's what money's been for the last like 50 years. And it's it's an experiment. And it doesn't look like this one's going to work out at some point. I can't tell you exactly when, whether it's a year or five years or 10, always hard to predict exactly when, but like this experiment is headed like towards a cliff that it's going to go off. And that's what, that's again, like, that's why I just say like, look, we, we, we hope for the best. We wish the best, but like, we're, I'm not taking chances. I'm putting my money in Bitcoin. That cannot happen to Bitcoin. Yeah, I've got a question for you about that. I'm going to come back to that, though, just because of uh, Cameron's other point is that it's really interesting what you said about like people in Argentina. I was out in uh, La Bitconf in Uruguay, and I was sat with two guys from Argentina, and they were explaining to me what happened with La Coralita. And he said, the thing about people just don't trust the banks. So he was telling me about some, I think he was telling me about some lady who was buying a house. She kept all her money in the house, and she bought the house in cash, and she took it with her. Uh, and, and and he said explaining Bitcoin to people there is really easy. And an, another really interesting thing, I think one of you saw it, because I think one of you saw my tweet, that two weeks after the news of the uh, Lebanese currency collapse, my show was the biggest show on uh, Apple Podcasts in Lebanon. It was just really fascinating wow. to see that happen. And that's starting to happen more. So I've I've hit like three or four different markets at number one now. But the, when it happened in Lebanon, literally a week or two weeks after, I was just like, I don't think that's a coincidence. Right. Yeah, that, that's really fascinating how how sort of it's coming online or Bitcoin is, is really sort of the, the hot spot of interest is uh, flaring up in different parts of the world where uh, there's, there's these real problems. I mean, I remember Cyprus. Um, mm. if, if you were in Bitcoin back in... I believe it was uh, either 13 or 14. um, I'm not remembering exactly right now where they did basically a bail in um, and they took haircuts of depositors, everything above a hundred thousand euros. People couldn't get their money out of banks. um, It's effectively frozen and you lost um, your value above a hundred thousand euros. That really shook the world, I think in a big way. And a lot of people were turned on a Bitcoin at that time not necessarily people in Cyprus, but people who saw what just went down and were like, wait a second. So that was kind of interesting. So there's there's going to be those catalysts um, more and more over the next couple of years. And, and I think with the internet and the flow of information and things like that, the education curves are probably gonna be you know, pretty quick. And that's, that's happened in the US. Um, FDR's executive order um, I'll try and figure it out. Uh, it's like 1602 yeah. confiscated goal in the U S. So if anyone, um, memories are short, they tend to be, you know, as humans, we sort of like have amnesia, but like people who are up on their, their history realizes that like these kind of things even happen in the U S. Um, the, the idea of helicopter money was like theoretical. I don't think I ever thought we'd see, see this right. Milton Friedman's sort of, um, parable. It happened. Uh, could the U.S. turn around and, and tell her just to just joke like the, the the helicopter money? That imagery is, I think, a person literally tossing bills out of a helicopter yeah. into the hands of like people. It's like direct distribution into individuals. Um, it's as if like you know money literally just shows up in your bank account as it did, um, right? And so. Um, the idea of all of a sudden the U S saying, Hey, we're going to socialize some losses. We kind of screwed up over here. I'm just going to haircut the top of the bank accounts um, of everyone. Like it it can happen. It can happen. It's happened around the world. Um, It happened in Cyprus. You know, these kind of things happen outside of the U S all the time. And again, the U S is like, we're in completely uncharted 
waters as a country. So like anything is possible. Well, look, Cameron, you said earlier, soon it's going to be it's irresponsible not to, I think it was you who said it was not it was going to be irresponsible did, yeah. not to be holding Bitcoin. Why soon? I think it's now. I, I genuinely think it's irresponsible yeah. now. Totally. Yeah. I, I, I think I, you're I, right. So I I think everything, I look at all the cash I have, I, I, like what do I need over a one month, one year cycle? Everything over uh, beyond the one year cycle to me is risky holding it in, in pounds. And that's just considering kind of like Bitcoin volatility. Um, but I, I do gen, genuinely think it's risky. So I'm with you on your whole thesis. Right. Um, the other thing is um, it's still an incredible trade for a company. Yeah. I mean, it's not just a store of value trade. It's still early. And Bitcoin's an emergent sort of value. So the next couple of uh, companies or large hedge fund managers that take massive positions and actually talk about it and tell the world, hey, we took a $100 million position or a $500 million position in Bitcoin. Um, that's like a trade of the court, you know, could be the trade of the century, kind of like the George Soros trade, you know, breaking the pound. He sort of saw what was happening there. Um, Bitcoin is still that once in a lifetime trade for a couple of brave companies or, or, uh, or money managers. So it's even more exciting than like, hey, it's it's it, you know uh, a question of responsibility or, or or saving your wealth. It's actually like a massive opportunity, and it's and it's out right. there and in I, plain. It's it's right out there in the open, and it's just right. a matter of time before some smart people figure that out. And, and a lot of people they say, oh, a twelve thousand dollar Bitcoin that that sounds expensive, but know, you know our right. thesis is, <laughs> yeah, and it's it's um. You know, it's so early. It's like buying, you know, Amazon in in the early two thousands in the knots. Like, and you know, if we're right, there's a forty five x appreciation from twelve thousand. Twelve thousand will be look incredibly cheap. And I think that sometimes the it's almost like if Bitcoin did a stock split and and um, you know split like uh, buy into a hundred pieces or whatever people can sort of psychologically wrap their head around buying like a hundred dollar share or something. And going back to the education piece, I think a lot of people think you actually have to buy one Bitcoin, just like well, a single yeah. Bitcoin. But you could, uh, I mean, you could test it on Gemini and just sell, sell it based on price per sat. You could do that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, look, it is what it is. You know, people will, or they won't buy. And, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely confident. Let me ask you though, like, it's a good question to ask everyone. When you first saw the micro strategy deal, because I think that came like out of the blue for a lot of people. It was a bit of a whoa moment. It wasn't like some companies put ten million dollars in or even fifty million. It was like it was four hundred fifty million dollars. It was close to half a billion dollars. It was a real wow moment. I think it shook everyone up. Um, it's been really interesting to listen to Michael Saylor talk. I've had him onto the podcast as well that and then following that obviously we had the square square putting money in again fascinating and in some ways a bigger deal even though theirs was a lot lot smaller bet i think it was a bigger deal just because who they are how did you take both of those in cameron so um i think that the, the micro strategy obviously a big bet um and i think that's uh partly a function of the the michael saylor being the founder of the company and it sort of being a founder driven decision which I think is great, right? He can sort of um, make that kind of move. And we've spoken with Michael and, and he really, I think the way he, he thinks about Bitcoin is, is, you know, very in line with our views of, of sort of the, uh, the technology and the promise and, and kind of the, uh, the benefits of, of owning the asset. So I thought it was really exciting. And I think you were talking earlier, it's sort of gradually then suddenly. Yeah. Um, and I think I think we're going to see that um, play out. I think the Square News, um, obviously, Jack has been pretty vocal supporter of Bitcoin over the past couple of years. So it was great to see him sort of put balance sheet behind that. And I would I wouldn't be surprised if we see more of that from from him. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, fifty million dollars is obviously it's a lot of money on an absolute level, but that's something they could do probably quarterly.
at this, you know, easily without, without uh, thinking much about it. And so I think we're going to see, I don't know if it's a couple more and then we start to see a wave. Um, But I think that there's sort of two ways to look at it. Like one, as Tyler mentioned, like Bitcoin's an emergent sort of value. So it's not, you know, it, it is a really interesting trade. And then there's going to be individual or, or uh, corporations that say, look, we're kind of crazy if we don't put one, two or three percent of our of our treasury in this thing, because it's such a binary asymmetric potential payment and outcome. Because there there isn't sort of like I don't know how you you um, the debt problem is, is is getting to the point of being irreversible at this point. And you, you just can't reverse that. And, 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 and it becomes sort of asymmetric, I think. So it feels like you really need to put even a few percentage points there in that outcome. Mm. Yeah. I mean, MicroStrategy starts, then Square. Do we think there's not going to be a third, a fourth, a fifth or sixth company? <laughs> like. I think those chances are much greater than, the, than this idea that Michael Saylor and, and MicroStrategy and Jack Dorsey and Square are the only two in the world for the rest of the history that do this. And so it's super exciting because I think we all sort of, all the three of us believe this would happen. Then you start to see it happen. It's only a matter of time before it becomes a deluge. And then countries are gonna do the, have the same thinking, right? With, mm-hmm. with their treasury services. And that's going to happen. And it's not just and once one, then two, um, and then all of them. So when I kind of go back to the other part of the conversation, it's so freaking early. Like 500,000 yeah. well, Bitcoin is conservative. Like, like that's conservative. Well, I think there's right. an in-between and, and, stage. I just want to throw in there. So something that's quite interesting that I've observed is that I think it's it's obviously quite complicated for a, a big multi-million dollar like you know a company that does hundreds of millions of revenue to start considering especially if they've you know if they're a, um, a listed company to start putting money into bitcoin but it's very easy for let's say small versions of michael saylor like myself one two three man four man businesses to do it i'm already in bitcoin i'm already bought into the thesis it's actually in some ways, it's easier to buy Bitcoin with company money than personal money because personal money, you're always thinking, well, do I need that for something? But company money, it never seems as real. A bit like company expenses. I mean, it might, I don't know when it, what it was like when you first started doing business, but when you go for dinner and you're spending the, using the company card, you can be a little bit more out there than maybe with your personal card because it's it's not, the, the money doesn't always seem so real. We've got tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people into Bitcoin who run companies and maybe small companies who are already wanting to buy Bitcoin. So in in the two weeks since I interviewed Michael Saylor, I've had four companies get in touch with me and say, oh, Pete, how do, you, how do companies uh, buy Bitcoin? How do small companies buy Bitcoin? So I think there's an impact. They come to stage. Gemini. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they can go to Gemini and they come can- Come on, Peter. Oh, come on, I've, come on, I've already got a sponsor. You know this uh, answer. Well, actually, the first thing I say to them is go to Castle and get their, um, make sure they get their security sorted. But, but- the point being is that there's, I think there's this in-between stage where a lot of small company or small business owners will be moving in first, and then you'll start to see the bigger companies as they figure their shit out. Right, right. Well, yeah. and, and I mean, I think like, look, you're a great microcosm, your experience, the idea, like the divorce, how you got into Bitcoin, like people will have those challenges, right? And companies are mm-hmm. just groups of people and countries are larger groups of people. If it's true for you, at some point, it's going to be true for a small business, a large business, a small country, a large country. It, it's not like human behavior or um, the challenges you face are so different than what a company or country faces. So I think it's just a matter of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah and, and if you look at um, central banks bought more gold in 2018, the highest amount of gold bought since 1967. Wow. Why are they doing that? Um, well, we know, you know, any guesses, right? <laughs> Cause they um, know they're, they're, they're on borrowed time. You know, they're, they're all bag holders and they're, and they're picking up gold because that's the sort of the muscle that they have. They know how to buy gold. They've been doing that for hundreds of years. Um, they don't really know how to buy Bitcoin yet. 
and I think it makes sense that that you, um, other companies, and and some now publicly listed companies are sort of the first off the diving board. But eventually, the central banks are going to realize that if they don't start getting in there, they're going to be the last ones at the party, and that's not a good place. To and be. it's a lot and better. So to there be will first. be there will be a micro strategy version of a central bank that takes a risk and says, "Hey, we've done this." And they're going to do it quietly and accumulate their position. Yes. And then they're going to go out and talk about it. And then things are going to get really interesting. Completely bonkers. Yeah, crazy, crazy stuff. Well, listen, look, a couple couple more things I want to talk to you about before we close out. Um, uh, firstly, just a kind of broader question around, you know, you've been in Bitcoin for a while now. What do you think are the, some of the key issues and challenges that like are on your mind right now for the kind of future of Bitcoin? So I think a lot of people in the, in the, you know, the peak of the pandemic thought, oh, is Bitcoin a safe haven asset? Wait a second, what was up with that big sell-off? And I think what we've sort of learned is that cash is still sort of king in a liquidity crisis um, when people have to make margin calls and settle and all that thing. And so, you know, it's not there yet, right? People had to go into cash to, to, buy Bitcoin. And when your hair is on fire, you, you know, buying Bitcoin isn't the first thing that's sort of top of mind. And I think though, now as the dust is sort of settling, people have the, the space, the headspace to think about what's been going on and then the bandwidth to sort of then go buy Bitcoin. So I think it's, you know, that was one of the things that I saw um, in the past six months. And I think a lot of people are just quietly accumulating and um, there's going to probably be some kind of catalyst or inflection point over the next 12, 24 months or so. But I think that that, like, I think a lot of people thought, hey, this is safe haven. People are just going to rush into Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. and, and that didn't happen. Um, next time, it may happen because a lot of people are. But, but also, th this was a bit different, right? Because it's um, the whole economy shuts down. Right. I don't think Bitcoin is necessarily a hedge against the economy and, the, you know, being uh, on complete lockdown. It's ultimately a hedge to all of the Faustian bargains that governments have to make to get through the pandemic and lockdown. It's a hedge to the next decade or two decades of hyperinflation and all of the distortion and disruption that that, you know, reeks on um, economies. But I'm really optimistic about like Bitcoin. You know, it's definitely in terms of like um, the sort of value gold 2.0, it's Bitcoins to lose. Frankly, like the two blockchains right now that have a lot of activity is really Bitcoin and Ethereum. And that's a sort of a measure of the demand for block uh, block space uh, in each tra you know transaction space. So there's you know you look at transaction fees of Bitcoin or Ethereum. There's actually demand. There's scarcity. There's a lot of uh, people who want to get in there. Almost every other blockchain is a ghost town. Um, there is no demand for its scarce resource, which is uh, space in each transaction block. Mm. And so. It's really Bitcoin's race to lose in terms of taking up the mantle with, you know, gold 2.0 story. And generally speaking, especially with protocols and money, I think first mover advantage is quite large. Um, something really catastrophic would have to happen to Bitcoin for that not to work. And I don't know, like may maybe I'm not as close to, I'm definitely not as close to the, you know, um, maybe the current events with like core developers day to day, but I, I see just good news. Yeah. I see micro strategies. I see square. I see not that this is news we want, but I see really bad news coming out of uh, fiat regimes and feds and money printers and European central banks. I see zero interest rates, negative interest rates. People are like, where, where, where can we go? There's only, there's only one answer. It's, it's into Bitcoin, into crypto. Um, so like, the stage is set, and I think all of the levers, all the catalysts are there. 
I think mm-hmm. we're going to see a tremendous bull run. Mm-hmm. And I, there aren't a lot of things that give me pause or make me worry, frankly. Uh, obviously, you just mentioned like the Bitcoin core developers. Are you? Do you guys sponsor any core developers? I um, so I, I I knew I saw this question coming. You knew it was going to um, come. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so directly sponsor? I don't believe we do. It's a great question. We're open to it. Um, I think you know, as the world works, we all get really busy in our bandwidth, but. It's something we were open to. So if you have any ideas around that, you know, let us know. Well, look, I had the I had the chat with Brian and it, you know, it, it was a he he took it really well and and you know what, fair play to him. He went away, he did it, and they've committed to uh sponsoring two developers. I'm not like a techie. If if there's something you guys want to do, there's people I would uh put you in touch with who who know better better than this than me. And there's different people. You could go via someone like Alex Gladstein who's raising who's always looking to support open source development, which helps some of the more human rights causes. You could put out your own piece um where people could apply to you for a grant. Um, there's some de- there's some developers you could speak to. I, I know Luke Dasher mm-hmm. who uh, is looking for funding right now. So look, I think I think if you if you want to do it, it's a cool thing. But I, I I would suggest you just go away, have a think about it. If you if you want a suggestion for me, all I would do is just introduce you to somebody who would know it better than me. But I mean, it's a bit of a mission of mine just to kind of raise it in a, a lot of the interviews because I know right. it's an ongoing issue. And without the without the developers, we we don't really have the network. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Good point. Um, yeah. It's 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 interesting because I feel like over the years I've sort of lost touch with what the community of core developers are on Bitcoin. I'm not sure quite quite why. You know, there were years ago in our early office at Gemini, we were across the street from Chain Code Labs. I remember the days back when Mike Hearn was in in Bitcoin uh, as a core developer, and then he left, and so. And the thing that's interesting also, ironic, I guess, is I'm more active on Twitter these days um, than I are. was even back then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, that's one of the, so I guess, silver linings of, of the lockdown pandemic. But like back in the day, you know, Gavin Andreessen was a big thought leader on the core dev side. Um, it was just clearer like where that was. And then there was uh, the block size debate, civil war stuff. And to be frank, like, I just don't know where core dev is these days. Mm. I don't know if like some of the characters I followed on Twitter are still there. I don't see them tweeting as much. Obviously there's block stream going on, but yeah, like, frankly, I'm not like super close to where it is and what factions or whatnot, but like, um, obviously like we care about core development. We care about Bitcoin deeply. We have you know, we don't have our skin in the game. We have our whole bodies in the game. So, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe that's maybe that's like a little bit of the problem is the fact that guys who run a, a an exchange like Gemini who own Bitcoin, who are on Twitter, who follow a lot of people on Twitter and crypto. Um, that's really why I use Twitter. I'm not really sure where the state of uh, 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 the current state of affairs are mm-hmm. with development. Like, what is the foundation? Where can I send my Bitcoin or my fiat dollars to support? So I'm sure it's there. Um, And then, of course, we all have our busy lives, Mm. right? And we're sort of just like chugging along. And and now we lead 300 people at Gemini 300 and growing. So, yeah, that's just me being as transparent with you as, as, as possible in terms of like, yeah, we haven't thought about this a lot. We should know this. How do we not know this? Um. But it's really not clear, like who's doing what and how to get involved. And I'm. Sh- it sounds like you know, and and um, mm-hmm. you know, it's awesome that Brian. Hey Tyler, I would just, I was just throwing that. Hey, we're, we are on Twitter as as you mentioned. Um, and so if anybody, you know, feel free to DM us any any core developers that are listening. You know, happy oh. to kind of hear hear what's going on. Um, yeah, that could be an easy way to your DMs are going to be Some some of this. <laughs> don't I mean, worry look, they, they already are i think the thing to do i mean you know brian you could probably chat to him about what he's been through i i, I think i mean look it, the first step is having interest I, I guess you'll go and talk about it if 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 you are committing to it 
then it won't be difficult to find people. There are always people who are looking to be s- sponsored. Um, I always think it's quite nice when a company specifically sponsors one, whatever, two people, because they, they it's kind of like they, they can obviously be very grateful and thankful directly back to you. I have, I've got an interview with the developer out today who was, uh, she was uh, Amiti. Was she started Chain Code, and then she was sponsored by Zappo. I always think that's kind of nice. Um, but I think I think I think the first step is for you guys just to probably think about it internally. Once you've like rationalised if you want to do it, then you can ask me. But I'm really just going to put you in touch with uh, a developer themselves who will help you navigate it. But the fact that you're open to it is is pretty cool, and I think um, I think you'll get a, a lot of thanks and appreciation for that. Yeah, that's cool. And and it's interesting because I mean, I'll chase you down as um as an exchange, if we you know support a new protocol, we're talking with that community, that team, and oftentimes finding bugs. You know, we're helping troubleshoot. So it is a very collaborative, synergistic thing. You know, when an exchange takes on a protocol, uh, taps into a community. With Bitcoin, you know, it's just the oldest, and it's it's worked. Um, you know, we've. We support it in our own way by helping people get into Bitcoin by um of course. So but but you're right, like like we should have a better bead on the core developers who's contributing right now, you know, and, and try and help that way. So, you know, I'm glad you raised the question and we're definitely open to it. Amazing. All right, like last question, because then I'm gonna let you go. What's going on with the sequel? <laughs> Bitcoin billionaires. Uh yeah, it is it is it? um it's happening. I mean, it's it's on it's in route. Um, obviously, nothing's filming yet, but in the process of um, screenwriting, not us, but um, other folks. So, uh, pens are pen is going to paper, and it's starting to come to life. So, hopefully, hopefully, uh, a script sometime soon, and then um, you know, go into production, uh, get the right studio. I don't know, maybe a Netflix, we'll see, and just move along. But but uh I think it's a really it's a fun story, and I and I think it does a pretty good job of it's a bit escapism, right? But it's also um mm-hmm. explains Bitcoin. Um and I think it could help people make it more approachable, have a fun sort of roller coaster comeback story, and learn a little bit about one thing that's important to me is that people learn something. You know, they sort of start, they, they leave the theater questioning a little bit about the dollars in their pocket or the be a little bit more open to Bitcoin and just get the conversation going about money because it's so fundamental to all of our lives. It's something we rely on, we use every day. And I want to see more people get financially independent, you know, have more access um, and sort of take control of their lives. So if this movie, just sort of like the social network, if the best thing that came out of it, it sort of um, encouraged a whole and inspired a whole generation to try and become entrepreneurs, do their own startups. Don't go work for the company and become, you know, work for the man, but they can take a risk, go out there and do that. So I think, you know, it's near and dear to our heart for this movie to not only be fun, entertaining, but also inspire and teach. Who's going to play you? <laughs> uh, it's a good question. Undecided. But I feel like you, guy, you should, was it Josh Josh Pence was it? Uh, so he played me from the neck down. An Army Hammer. Played, oh, was that what it was? Yeah, oh. Army Hammer. Played, I'm not going to try like playing it smart. I've got IMDb open here. Yeah, yeah. So Cameron, um, Army Hammer played Cameron completely, and then they superimposed oh, Army's face onto my, uh, onto Josh's body. So Josh, you know, was a neck down actor, and Army got my head and Cameron you know, his full body. So, um, yeah, yeah. he could be cool. Um, you know, that, that's, that'd be interesting. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of good, good options, but, um, I don't know, maybe, I guess my question to you is, are you going to make a cameo in the Ibiza scene? In the which scene? The Ibiza scene. I mean, I, I would love to make a cameo. I would absolutely love to make a cameo, but I, I don't think I'm worthy of it. I, I look, do you, do you know what? The social networks are just a really, really high bar. I, uh, I just, I, I really, I'm looking forward to over. Also, the the funny thing was when we did the last interview, I hadn't listened to the full book. I got it and I got the audio book and I got through a kind of like about a third. Uh, I finished the whole thing out running during the pandemic. I just nice. to go for a run around the park and did the whole thing. Um, 
it's a really engaging convers it's a really engaging um really engaging book really engaging to like listen to what you went through especially the whole bit with like the when you set off on the planes um to go and do what you did there was really interesting and just just little bits that stood out the the paper cup i don't know why i just kept remembering the paper cup as well um is that were you in the is that in the lawyer's room oh the the, paper the cup? is that just me the mediation and then the pizza like drooling or someone just little things stood out but the whole yeah bit with the planes was fascinating just blew my mind um so i'm looking forward to it um i hope it will uh hold up to fincher's work with the social network and uh yeah i mean and yeah listen it's great i mean it's um it's a little bit a different story you know um of course and it's also um yeah it you know i hope it hits the standard too but it's also a different world right um, you know, mm-hmm. our movie theaters, our feature releases, the way things are done these days, yeah. or is it an over the top streaming? Is it episodic in a couple of different episodes? Um, or is it, you know, a two hour feature? Um, so it's really interesting just to see how much the world changed from like, and we had we had nothing to do with the original movie, but we, we had a front row mm-hmm. seat to sort of watch it all happen. And the award season and and all this stuff and the Oscars and like, are those, is that the same way you would do it today? Or is this that type of story? Is it um, still relevant? Those structures of power, you know, um, the same way. And, and I think it's different. And I think this, this story is definitely a little bit more upbeat, less of like the betrayal, the Shakespearean betrayal kind of stuff, but more of like, you know, the Phoenix from the ashes comeback story, but, um, but yeah, look, we're going to, we're going to work hard to make it, make it great. What's going to, how's the, how's the trilogy going to end? Bitcoin trillionaires. Like what's your return? (laughs) Well, yeah, well, I've got an idea, by the way, I've, I've got a really good investment idea for you. If you become bit trillionaires, I think you should buy a soccer club. I don't know if you've heard about these actors who've bought a soccer club, but is it football this... or soccer? Well, I'm calling it soccer just to help you guys out. It's football. All right. You're being kind. Thank yeah, I'm you. I'm being kind. But they, I think you should buy Bedford Town Football Club. They're in the lowest of all the low leagues. So they're really cheap. I would run it for you. And I think you could get Bedford Town in the Premier League with a Bitcoin logo on the shirt. I think I think that would be a good investment if you if you become trillionaires. What do you think about that? We'll Makes consider sense. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you said it now you now you said that people oh, no. now listen look appreciate you both coming on again it's look always a pleasure to talk to you love talking about bitcoin with you both and everything you do and appreciate you like considering the idea about open source development um i will chase you up on that like i did with brian so sorry about that um but listen love everything you do just tell people how to stay in touch how to follow what you both are up to yep great thanks for having us peter um we're on twitter probably the best way to Stay in touch. Our DMs are open. So hit us up there. All right. Wicked. Thanks so much, Peter. No worries, man. I'll put it in the show notes. Take care and I'll see you soon. Cheers. Take it easy. Okay. How was that? How bullish are you feeling right now? That was a monster. I do really like talking to Tyler and Cameron. They're good sports. I do wind them up a little bit, but they are really good sports. Uh, Really relaxed and easy to talk to. And uh, hopefully one day. Once the planes are flying, I'll be back in New York or they'll be in London and we'll get to do one of these in person. And like I said in the intro, if you've not read their paper, it is definitely worth checking out. There is a link to it in the show notes. It's really well put together, especially the piece on US dollar. Actually, that was a bit I found more interesting than gold. I'm sold on the gold thing, but the way they were looking at the US dollar, that bit was also very convincing for me because... Whilst people think about stores of value, I mean, I don't know how many people hold gold. I think a lot of people just keep cash in one way or another. So that was very interesting. Um, I did also video the interview. I'll try and get that up as soon as possible. We're just trying to get the the workflow for that sorted so we can get videos out sooner. Anyway, if you've got any questions, you can hit me up. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. If you want to support the show, please head over to iTunes and leave me a review. Reviews are really, really helpful for the listings. So it takes about two minutes. And I know a bunch of you have done it recently, but I know tens of thousands of people listen to this. So... I could do with a few more. So if you don't mind doing that, thank you very, very much. Also, go and check out my other show, Defiance. I've told you all about it. The Ghislaine Maxwell series is really, really topical right now. We've got part six coming out on Monday. That's available at defiance.news. Outside of that, if you have any questions, my email address is hello at whatbitcoindead.com. Have a great weekend. Love you all and see you all next week.